The Rhine and Danube rivers divided the Roman world from the rest of Europe, just as much as they united the two spheres. And people living across the frontier zone interacted heavily with the Roman Empire, serving in the Roman military and trading with Roman merchants, with the end result being that Roman goods have been discovered as far afield as Norway, Sweden, and the Baltic Sea region. And those goods included armor and weapons, and oftentimes, those would be preserved in ritualized weapon deposits and burials, usually in bogs, especially in Denmark. And, at one site in Denmark, Vimos, one of the pieces of armor turned up by archaeologists is a coat of mail. This is the famous Vimos coat, and it speaks to the interconnectedness of Central Europe and the Roman Empire, as the armor appears to show signs of both Roman and Germanic designs. It was locally made, so far as we can tell, but it was made according to Roman standards and to Roman practices. Now, the Vimos coat is arguably one of the best preserved pieces of Roman mail that we have from the classical period, if not the best preserved one. It is almost entirely complete and is not nearly as corroded into a large chunk of metal like so many other remains. One of the other major finds of Roman mail was at the site of Nove, a military camp used by the Romans located in modern-day Bulgaria, and which was occupied from about the middle of the 1st century into the 5th. And we have a total of 21 loose fragments and rings from that site which provide ample evidence for male construction for most of the imperial period. The Vimos coat and the Nove fragments, especially the larger ones, were constructed in a similar fashion, which, when compared to examples from the late medieval period, show that there were strong differences in armor of construction. Like almost all Roman mail, these pieces consisted of alternating rows of riveted and solid rings. The row-by-row -row alternation of ring types was necessary to form a mesh. Solid rings, as their name suggests, could not connect to each other but needed to be linked with the riveted rings. In mail studies, it is therefore assumed that each row consisted of just one type of ring along the entire circumference. European historical coats of mail from the late medieval period that are made up of riveted and solid rings do indeed show this pattern of one ring type per entire row. This indicates that the medieval mailmaker worked in the round, that is, adding rows while working his way downwards. However, recent examination of the mail coat from Vimos, probably the best preserved example of archaeological mail, has suggested that the medieval way of making mail was not necessarily employed during the Roman period. In the Vimos garment, each row suddenly shifts from riveted to solid in a vertical line underneath the armpit. That is, each single row containing riveted rings on the front of the garment consisted of solid rings at the back, and rows with solid rings at the front contain riveted rows in the back. And rows with solid rings at the front contain riveted rows at the back. This detail indicates an important difference in construction, showing that whereas medieval mail was made by adding rings in the round, the Vimos coat was made in the flat, meaning that it was constructed as a single large flat panel that included both sides of the garment and the sleeves. Once finished, the large sheet of mail would have been folded at the center, creating a front and back, enclosed with riveted rings at the side and back of the trunk and the undersides of the sleeves, finally forming a true coat of mail. The shift in ring type is observed where the front and back meet. So, Roman mail, then, was constructed in the same manner in which the Romans made tunics. The Vimos coat extends for more than a meter hanging below the knees, and the coat does not show evidence of shaping techniques. The slit for the neck is just that, a slit, formed by leaving out a couple rows, and the sleeves extend to cover most of the upper arms, being a continuation of the rings from the main body, and being reduced as the sleeves reach the end, so it was tapered to a slight degree. The armpit section was also constructed in the flat by seaming the underside and connecting the front and back of the main body. In the 14th and 15th centuries, which is the period we have enough evidence from to really make any sort of extensive comparison, armorers sought to equally balance the protection offered by the coat with mobility and weight. So to do that, the thickest rings were placed on the front of the mail because this area would be taking the brunt of the damage while thinner and thus lighter rings would be used on the back and the sleeves. Unlike in Roman mail, the armpits of late medieval mail pivoted, making a 90 degree angle rather than being a direct extension of the links used in constructing the torso. While we don't have enough evidence to directly say that Roman mail did not take the size of the wearer into account, although they probably did, 
we do have enough evidence which points to various methods of construction in the medieval examples which show that armorers took this into consideration and that mail could be tailor-made. If the coat needed to be widened at any point, two different techniques could be employed in the medieval period. The first was the insertion of triangular-shaped pieces of mail to widen the coat in specific areas. The other, slightly more complex method, was inserting what are called idle links, connecting one in three rather than one in four. The Romans don't appear to have altered the ring size at all, and our surviving examples do not seem to suggest that the Romans took weight into consideration to the same degree that late medieval armorers did. This isn't to say that they didn't take this into consideration at all, however, far from it. We know from the Vimos and the Nove coats, as well as a few other examples, that Roman mail was made wide enough and loose enough to fit over undergarments and possibly a Roman version of the gambeson. But it was not wide enough to be baggy while wearing it, and it appears to have been designed to fit snugly. So, in conclusion, then, there appear to be numerous differences in Roman and late medieval period mail, which indicates that we should not just attempt to understand this form of armor with generalizations about ring size and construction methods, and that there needs to be a cultural context taken into account when analyzing military equipment.